Um, so the quick introduction, Michael Gartman is with the Rocky Mountain Institute. He's one of their staff scientists. I'm not sure what you'd like your preferred title to be, but one of the brilliant people who work at that organization. And he um, has been leading on the electrification team that they have there. And specifically, I got um, to have the immense pleasure of working with him to supply him a lot of costing information I was able to gather, as well as lots that he'd gathered as well. And he wrote a paper about what is the cost of gas infrastructure, what is the cost of comparative types of heat pump water heaters using a national data set. This is by far the most comprehensive study that's been done on what does it cost to put in um, gas infrastructure, because we used all the studies that have come out so far on what gas infrastructure cost and more. So this is both authoritative on that and heat pump water heaters. So um, enjoy. Thank you, Michael, so much for coming. Thank you, Sean, for having me. And can you see my slides all right? You can see your slides, your audio is perfect. Take it away. All right, let's jump into it. Um, just a, a quick overview on, on what I'll be covering today, just a, a quick introduction on where the market is today and why uh, this work that Sean just outlined matters, highlighting three of the big insights that came out of that work, uh, and then just looking very quickly at how things will change moving forward. Um, and I, I think, Sean, you said this, but I know I, I saw that uh, Craig from GE already had a, a presentation on retrofitting heat pump water heaters. This is all about new construction. Um, so let's, let's get going. First off, the, the market today. Uh, the short of it is that most uh, water heaters today uh, use fossil fuels. The majority of that is, is uh, natural gas, uh, I think. Heat pump water heaters, the, the last I saw from uh, Energy Star reports was that there is something like a 2% market penetration. So very small part, piece of the market, but we see that increasing pretty substantially. Uh, from 2011 to 2019, there's been a 15%, a uh, what is that, a compound annual growth rate? Yeah, I got, I got it, I got it. Uh, so a 15% growth uh, every year from 2011 to 2019, still a very small part of the market but growing rapidly. Uh, there are a number of reasons for that growth. One is state and city carbon goals. As I'm sure we all know, 30 plus uh, cities in California have uh, established gas moratoriums now. Uh, similar work is happening, uh, or at least being looked at in Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia. The, this is all, all happening very quickly. Um, the reason that uh, heat pump water heaters are becoming a, a focus so quickly is that in combination with renewable grid penetration, so the, the carbon argument for uh, converting the heat pumps is only getting stronger. There's also some technology progress, improved efficiencies. You can find efficiency factors of uh, three to four pretty easily now. Uh, inverter driven compressors are opening up uh, cold climate markets. And as Sean loves talking about, uh, distributors are introducing some of these uh, retrofit ready heat pump water heaters, um, which is really important because over 80% of uh, water heater sales are in the retrofit market. And heat pumps really just historically have not been able to penetrate that. That's quickly changing. And Michael, before you progress, um, you point out that most homes use fossil fuels for hot water. But what is the minority share that use electric resistance or this obviously small percentage of heat pump water heaters? Maybe like 40, 60 percent? Like, uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it's about 40, 60, yeah. Okay, good. So we, we can grow into the electric resistance water heater market. Um, but anyway, you're doing new construction. Carry on. Just want to get that out there. Absolutely. It's a, it's a good call out. The, the economics for converting electric resistance to heat pumps are, are often a lot better. So the problem here, uh, something that's hampering this growth, is just the fact that costs are still relatively poorly understood. There just isn't a, a great uh, database of costs provided that uh, developers and policymakers and contractors can use to understand what they're getting into if they haven't been doing this for a while. Uh, so the work that we did, I'll, I'll be pretty quick here because uh, Sean outlined it pretty well, but uh, we compiled over 70 cost quotes from a, a wide range of distributors, cost studies, and projects from all across the country. A lot of them did come from California because of, that's where a lot of this action is happening right now, uh, but we, we looked elsewhere as well. Uh, I, I won't go into all the details on the system types that we're covering here. I think most of you will be familiar with what a central system is, what is typically used in a, a multifamily complex, what an individual tanked system is, 
the, the things you will, will see in a single family home. Uh, I'll just call out really quickly, uh, we're calling these multi-central systems. I've also seen them referred to as semi-central systems. It's uh, an emerging option in multifamily buildings uh, that uses the same technology as individual uh, tank systems, but essentially creates a, a cluster um, where each central plant serves two to eight units in the building. Um, we'll, we'll get into this in a little bit more detail in a bit, but it, it really hits this sweet spot of, of uh, low costs, like you see with central systems and high efficiency, like you see with individual systems. So that's what we're talking about. Let's just jump straight into the, the insights. So number one, heat pump water heaters can render gas infrastructure unnecessary. That's obvious, but what does it mean from a cost perspective? Um, here we're looking, this is really the, the key uh, chart from all of the research that we did, just summarizing the costs across uh, five different system types when you include 100% of gas infrastructure costs. You can obviously argue that you should only include 40 or 50% of the cost, depending on what other systems are in play. Um, but we have a, a spreadsheet database where you, uh, designers can uh, apply whatever percentage that they want to. But when you're considering the entire cost, uh, heat pump water heaters are actually pretty competitive. Uh, they're, they're still about $500 a unit. Uh, and, and sorry, when I say unit, I mean per, um, per housing unit per, per residence. Uh, about 500 bucks more per residence uh, with central systems. Individual systems, you come out on top because uh, if you're spending something like $2,000 for every single family home and it's only uh, $1,000 more for a heat pump water heater over a gas water heater, that's, that's a clear win. Um, these multi-central systems, which I'm really excited about, are actually pretty cost competitive with central gas systems. So that's uh, an important call out. Um, uh, just stepping back to the individual systems uh, again. So if um, if you're arguing, uh, say you're also considering a, a natural gas uh, HVAC system, and you only want to apply roughly half of the cost to uh, of gas infrastructure to your heat pump water heater system when you're doing this this cost benefit analysis, then uh, the individual systems gas and heat pumps roughly uh, even out. It's the the difference is less than a hundred dollars per per residence. Um, just calling out at the end here. So, so this is really the, the cost of gas infrastructure that a developer would incur in their project. It's the cost benefit analysis that they wanna do. We're not incorporating all of the costs of actually building and maintaining the, the gas infrastructure system. There are some costs that actually get rate based and apply to all uh, natural gas rate payers. So the, the societal cost is, is not really what we're talking about here. And if you try to consider that, uh, things still even more uh, heavily in, in favor of heat pump water heaters. The problem here is that those aren't the numbers the developers and policymakers are seeing. They're seeing the numbers without these gas, gas infrastructure costs almost all the time. And it's, it's a challenging problem to fight against because you're essentially trying to drive with one eye closed. You're not getting a, a complete view of the, the real cost picture here. So when you don't consider gas infrastructure costs, yeah, it, it looks clear that heat pumps uh, are, are a bit more expensive. Um, it's worth calling out that the uh, multi-central heat pump systems are actually still competitive uh, with the uh, natural gas central systems. So that's, that's an important call out there. Uh, and again, just the, the information that we uh, are providing in this report and the accompanying, accompanying cost addendum will allow developers and policymakers or anyone else that's on the line today uh, to play around with uh, your assumptions on how much gas infrastructure cost is applied uh, so that you can really uh, do your own scenario analysis here. Moving on, uh, one of the, the most important things in, in this work was really just figuring out exactly how to quantify what typical gas infrastructure costs are. This is a really challenging thing to pin down. Uh, as any uh, contractor will, will tell you, the, this ex actual number project to project can range probably by a factor of 100. Uh, the cost for uh, a new development that is uh, relatively close to existing developments, but just on the edge of them, is going to be a lot less than uh, having to uh, you know, cut a trench and dig uh, underground lines through a, a busy, busy street on an urban infill project. Those are just two completely different scenarios, but we did our best here to, to summarize um, 
what typical costs are for, for a range of different situations. This is relying on uh, quotes that we got from utilities, uh, from uh, energy consultants, and from general contractors. So the, this is, is probably one of the more important pieces of information that came out of this. Um, happy to have this here. It's really building off of uh, some of Sean's efforts, which I know I've seen at, at past zero carbon retreats. It's, it's a difficult number to pin down. Um, calling out again, you don't necessarily want to apply 100% of these costs to heat pump water heater systems. Um, that, that'll depend on, on the other systems that you're considering in your, in your analysis. And again, not considering all of the costs that get rate based to other consumers. The, these full societal costs are going to be higher than this. Moving on to insight number two, uh, super efficient systems can reduce costs. And I know these insights are relatively straightforward, but let's let's dig into some of the numbers. Um, the The concept here is, is essentially you can, of course, uh, have a super efficient gas system, but most of most gas systems are not installed that way. And if you compare a conventionally designed gas system to a heat pump water heater system that was designed with super efficient distribution and end uses, uh, the, the heat pumps with uh, a super efficient distribution and end uses um, can actually uh, be, be not only cost effective, but clearly win over the, the kind of conventional gas systems. Um, just some rules of thumb here, you can save roughly 25% on demand just by uh, working with uh, or working on efficient end uses. The most important thing here is shower heads, and that's what the, the graphic on the left uh, side of this chart is getting at. Uh, just because of their typical demand profile, uh, your shower is going to be uh, the, the primary end use that uh, defines how big of a water heater you need. You can save another 25% uh, by working with uh, really efficient distribution and recirculation systems. And that's the, the graphic on the right here that comes from uh, an ecotope-led eco study that I think I've actually seen in a, a past zero carbon retreat. Um, so, so many of you may be familiar with this. Uh, the idea here generally, so the, the blue uh, bits of these bars is really just the daily hot water load, which doesn't change with your distribution system. But a lot of the energy use of a, a central water heating system is actually just in getting the water there and keeping it warm. And if you have a super efficient distribution system, you can actually cut into that energy use and thus your, your total uh, capacity requirement pretty significantly. I just want to call out probably the, the cutting edge here uh, on super efficient uh, design is Pete Skinner's Solara project in upstate New York, uh, where he, he really cut down. I mean, this is half or less than half of a, a typical demand rule of thumb. And these are, are units that were sited outdoors in upstate New York. Uh, really, really impressive uh, work that Pete did. Uh, uh, he's a leader in this space, so it's not necessarily the most replicable thing. I don't, I don't know that we wanna go around recommending uh, that people who are just breaking into the heat pump water heater industry try to replicate what Pete's done here. Um, but it, it really points at just, just what can be achieved. Uh, and the, the other thing I want to call out is Pete's um, price that he achieved for this system was roughly $1,100 uh, per housing unit, which is uh, once you normalize, um, I'm sorry, I didn't hit that. All of the costs that we're talking about here have been normalized to uh, national average and to uh, you use the same sort of assumptions. Um, his cost was less than half of the median that we saw across all of the, the central heat pump water heater projects that we profiled. So it's a really impressive work. You can do more than that though. You can uh, do even better than just having, you know, a, a nice low flow shower head and some uh, good uh, high efficiency distribution. Um, you can achieve peak efficiency with multi-central system designs. I haven't actually seen the Avengers movie, but I know about this meme. Hopefully most of you do. Um, the, the idea here is basically that, that this system design, uh, it's, it's, unusual or, or uh, not, not particularly common today, uh, but it really hits this sweet spot of achieving uh, the system efficiencies that you get with an individual tank system because you have none of the central system pipe losses uh, that, that were covered in that stacked bar chart earlier. Um, but you're also getting to, to achieve some cost savings from economies of scale like you do with central systems. Um, so, you, so you get the high efficiency, you get the low cost. It's an absolute win. 
digging into a, a little bit more of what we actually mean when we say a multi-central system. This is actually uh, an example from uh, Sean's Coliseum Place, a six-story multifamily project. Uh, I believe it's in Oakland, but correct me if I'm wrong, Sean. Um, it, you can actually get pretty creative with the designs here. This particular design, uh, each uh, plant uses uh, one 80-gallon uh, tanked water heater. Uh, e each of those plants covers on average 2.3 residences. So some of these residences are actually supplied by multiple plants where you have uh, your bathroom and your kitchen supplied by by a different water heating plant. Seems seems a little unusual. It's it's not something that I think a lot of designers are going to be particularly familiar with. But it it again really uh, is is uh, the the best combination of cost and efficiency that you can achieve. Uh, and it really it it presents a, a lot of opportunities for innovative designs. One one other thing to call out here uh, on this particular project. Uh, is the, the project engineer's site of these plants uh, right next to the elevator shafts in the building to, to simplify, simplify venting and make sure that these uh, heat pump water heaters didn't adversely uh, affect uh, HVAC loads. A lot of opportunities like that. Well done, by the way, that's a great explanation. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> uh, jumping into our last insight. So heat pump water heaters are ideal for performance benchmarks. Uh, just want to hit another uh, case study that actually uses a similar uh, multi-central design. This is uh, Bank Flats, uh, which uh, was developed by Onion Flats out in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, this is a 28-unit multifamily uh, building with uh, retail on, I think, just the first floor. Um, they achieved, uh, what was it, $157 uh, per square foot for zero carbon passive house performance. So really impressive building all around. Uh, but one of the things that they did to make sure that they could actually cost effectively achieve zero carbon uh, was one of these multi-central systems. Uh, in this particular one, they have, let's see, uh, four central plants across the entire building. Uh, so each of these plants is two 80-gallon tanks piped in series, sited in the basement. Uh, and each of those plants has a stack of three to four homes uh, going vertically up throughout the building. They have super efficient distribution as well with uh, 3 8 inch uh, in-unit piping and a pipe-in pipe recirculation system. Um, but again, just stepping back here, uh, Bank Flats uh, <laughs> actually is pretty prolific as far as uh, passive house uh, multifamily developments go uh, because they're able to, they realized uh, that they were able to uh, take advantage of uh, low income uh, housing tax credits, uh, Pennsylvania, um, uses passive house certification as uh, one of the uh, bullet points on, on the application list so, so bank flats could get prioritized for some of that funding if they uh, achieve this level of performance and that they they found that to do so cost effectively um, these multi-central uh, heat pump water heater plants were, were really kind of a, a silver bullet that, that just made the the numbers work from an energy perspective energy and cost i guess um, but you don't have to be just looking at you know, net zero energy or zero carbon or passive house performance. Um, even uh, California's Title 24 uh, can make heat pump water heaters the lowest cost solution. So this is uh, profiling one particular project um, that uh, Mithin, a, a leading West Coast architecture firm, uh, looked at. Uh, they actually reviewed um, all six of their Bay Area multifamily developments uh, that they put together in 2019 and found that each and every one of them could be most cost effectively constructed uh, with a central heat pump water heater plant. I don't think they, they looked at multi-central plants in, in that equation, but just comparing central uh, gas and central heat pump water heaters, um, when they looked at the fact that uh, their central gas plants would be required to have a, a supplementary solar system, and also incur those gas infrastructure costs, uh, heat pump water heaters were a clear winner. This uh, particular graphic here is, is for the uh, most extreme case where uh, the heat pump water heater system was 62% cheaper than the, gas as, uh, than the gas estimate. That is including 100% of the in infrastructure costs, which is reasonable in this case because uh, I think they had already specified a, a heat pump HVAC system. Uh, but you can see from this graphic, even if you only incorporated something like 30% of the gas infrastructure costs, heat pump water heater systems would still uh, be cost competitive. 
let's see, I, I'm debating whether I want to get into exactly why the, the solar thermal systems are required, but uh, I think the short of it is it's, it's just a, a state level requirement uh, to offset the energy use of gas systems. Um, I'll leave it at that. So just, uh, I know I'm uh, coming up on time here and I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for questions. Uh, one or two more slides here. Um, this is a changing landscape and essentially uh, every change that we see happening is, is really just going to further benefit heat pump water heaters and further support their market growth. Uh, the, this first bullet here is from NREL's 2017 Electrification Futures Study. They projected roughly a 30% cost reduction and a 15% efficiency improvement on average from 2020 to 2040. Uh, so not only are, are each of these units going to get roughly 30% cheaper, uh, you will have some scenarios where the efficiency improves so much that homes don't need uh, to specify as large of a water heater as they would have otherwise. At the same time, you have gas rates uh, in California and likely across the country, but California is, is where uh, this has been uh, studied most comprehensively. Um, we see gas rates passing four dollars a therm by 2050, where they're I think still under two dollars. Yeah, still under two dollars a therm now. Uh, in the extreme case where we don't do any any sort of real gas system transition planning, uh, some estimates uh, show that cost uh, surpassing fifteen dollars a therm by 2050. Um, just to achieve uh, California's uh, carbon goals, again, if, if we do a really bad job planning for this. In combination with that, we have a carbon-free grid by 2045 in California. Uh, grids, uh, renewable penetration is happening all over the country, so the other states that might not, um, we might not hit carbon-free on that time frame, but um, the carbon benefit of heat pump water heater systems is only going to improve. Um, uh, and uh, on top of that, you have uh, really some of the, the most exciting technological developments for heat pump water heater systems are uh, just the development uh, of a low global warming potential refrigerants, which, which only improves the uh, life cycle environmental impacts. Uh, and finally, uh, at least in California, uh, smart controls uh, really present a, a kind of budding opportunity to improve the, the cost savings potential for heat pump water heater systems. Um, this uh, over 20% number is from uh, RMI's uh, 2018 report, Economics of Electrifying Buildings. Uh, they looked at uh, the most extreme time of use rate available in Oakland, California at the time, um, and found that uh, a heat pump water heater system with smart controls uh, could reduce energy bills by 20% for a homeowner. Now, uh, uh, I think the standard time of use rate that was uh, in, in place at the time in Oakland, it, the savings was only something like 3%. Um, but as time of use rates become more popular uh, and as they become more necessary, as, as we hit supply and demand issues with a, a greening grid, um, that, that number should go up. So there's a, there's a big implication here. Home builders, installers, policymakers, really need to start considering this opportunity. They need to innovate or they're going to risk being left behind. Um, it's, it's a changing landscape, it's changing really quickly uh, and it's, it's all changing in favor of heat pump water heater systems. So there's, there's a lot to learn here for uh, a lot of folks. You can start by reviewing our cost data. This is just a, uh, a screen capture of uh, the cost addendum that we provided alongside the report. Um, there is a lot of information packed in there that I, that I had no way of getting through in a 25 minute presentation, uh, but this is all publicly available. So feel free to download it, poke through it, uh, send us questions if you have any and uh, have fun with it. I have a link here for uh, not just that cost data, but also the full report and an accompanying blog. Uh, you can also uh, contact me um, with any questions that you have. And it looks like we have about five minutes for questions now. Thank you. Hey, Michael. Thank you for putting out the most definitive report yet published on these topics. Um, would you be willing to go back to the page? Um, as Suzanne Emerson, Rich Report has this cost data. You can see the, the link there, hopefully. Yep, oh yeah, she said, thank you. Great. Um, could you go back to the, the page on the comparative bar charts when gas is fully loaded to the domestic hot water, like you know, third or fourth slide, something like yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. Gas infrastructure included. 
So talking about Pete Skinner here for a moment, that multi-central heat pump, right? The, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, central heat pump on the far left. And that's his price, right? That's at the very lowest whisker that you see there. Smallest whisker. Like, it, well, it's yeah. at the very bottom there. I'm trying to remember. I think we might have had one project that actually landed lower than Pete's because I remember Pete landed at about $1,100 a unit. So it was maybe oh. the second lowest. I can't remember what the lowest cost one was. Well, that's actually a good answer to my question. It's like, well, this is a, a 25 percentile. Is that how I should interpret that? That line represents 25 percent of the, the information that we had? Yeah, exactly. And just one thing to call out here. So even though this is the most comprehensive study, there is still plenty of work to do, be done. This graphic, um, when we tried to compare all of the systems that, um, and make a true apples to apples comparison, a lot of those 70 plus quotes fell out. This is covering 24 quotes across five system types. So the, the ones that don't have whiskers attached, there are only uh, three or four quotes in there. Um, this is still a place where we could uh, clearly build out more and more cost data. Oh, that's why there's our whiskers there. Okay. So we, we did have decent data for the central heat pump though. And I yeah, guess to, to point out here, I, I see a lot of possibilities for cost compression because the, the systems that are more expensive those frequently are not designed in an optimal way where they would have more storage and less heat pump because storage is, is cheap. Like a tank for storage is a cheap thing and doubling up the, the size of the heat pump is expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like there's, there's a lot of sort of artificially high costs in there that are reflective of people's first or second or third times doing it as opposed to like say Sean Oram who presented earlier who has you know, quite a bit of, um, of expertise in it and can design a more optimized system. Yeah, so. absolutely. I, I don't think we have to name names here, but uh, you and I both know as we were scanning through some of the, the cost data that we got, just <laughs> seeing like, oh, this was clearly someone's first heat pump water heater project. That is <laughs> unusual. Uh, hey, there's, yeah. there's certainly some of that happening. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that um, you know some of the more experienced folks do get the lower prices unsurprisingly, but that, that's, I guess, a point I want to bring forward for other people is that there's opportunities to lower the cost of central heat pump water heaters and individual heat pump water heaters um, by expanding their market the way that, you know, the gas systems have you know, roughly 50% or more of the water heating in the country. If we had heat pumps with that same amount of market penetration, uh, this graphic would look different. We would have a, um, far more projects at the lower end, uh, you know, as people figure out how to, to save costs in their design. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the, the high end of the central gas systems is is really just uh, because of the situation um, it, when you hit those urban infill projects where uh, gas infrastructure uh, costs are just extreme and can cost more than the entire heat or the entire uh, water heating system itself. Yeah. On on the water heating or sorry on the heat pump side, it's a different story, and it really points to uh, for for local and state policymakers. Uh, the opportunity and I guess the essential need for uh, contractor training and education because there is a lot of cost compression that can happen just from smart design. Here, here. Um, uh, Reese Davis, um, you asked the question of, have you looked at the cost of added storage space? I know in urban areas that space for added storage can be pretty valuable and that's true. Um, when I've tried to get uh, more storage into developments, generally the storage is being put up on the roof and that there was excess space there. I mean, the the more tight, the, the more urban the project is really, the less space there is available for anything and all space becomes valuable. Um, but that's that's sort of seen is that um, there's more storage space available usually down in the parking garage where they're putting tanks um, and there was a sufficient storage space up on the roof. So it hasn't been much of an issue. Um, instead, in fact, it's the individual tanks that might be the least cost, most efficient system but because they have to go into the residential areas of the building, they're the ones that need some thoughtful carve outs um, that sometimes designers object to because they want to use that for something else. Um, yeah. <clears throat> it is a, it'll be a bigger concern in colder climates, like when we really start penetrating the, the Northeast and you have sub-zero temperatures that you have to worry about, uh, uh -huh. siding on the roof or, or otherwise outdoors becomes more of a concern, but we saw in Pete Skinner's project that, that, that there are ways uh, to, to still have a really good heat pump water heater system design. Yeah, he just mounts them high above the snow. 
<laughs> yeah. Puts a fishing system in, mounts it high. Um, and we don't have the shark in here, but that's a, a COP of 3.8 in the middle of winter up in Canada um, because they're using wastewater. So if they don't use the, the outside air, then it's um, then they keep their COPs really strong through the whole winter. They don't have to double up the, the system size or something. Um, okay, well, we are, we are at time. Thank you, Michael. That was awesome. Please, if you could go over to the chat and uh, respond to people's interests, I'd really appreciate that. Um, Absolutely, Jean, and thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it.